we are going to uh, try to cover <coughs> several different uh, uh, antennas, uh, commercial brought to you by Delta Club. <laughs> uh, actually, that's not true. I changed it just because of the Delta Club. Actually, this was this uh, this was put together when we had our little radio business. Uh, but just as a disclaimer, Delta Ram Radio Club does not recommend or endorse any particular antenna. Just pre presents each for discussion only. Because I guarantee you, if you take any of these antennas I'm going to show you tonight, and you Google them on the internet, you're going to get totally, you're going to get every different kind of opinion about them that, that you can get. So we just going to kind of introduce you to them, and you can make up your own minds. Uh, you want to remember, though, when it, no matter what type of antenna you put together, you want to. Uh, Keep in mind safety. Always. There have been a lot of people hurt by not watching where they're throwing a wire or throwing a piece of string and stuff like that or how tall the mast is they're trying to put up and how close it is to electric wires. So safety. And it's a few things. Don't, don't erect an antenna in high wind. Don't erect an antenna in close proximity to power wires. You should be aware of how tall the support mast is and how close wires are if, the, if it fell. Uh, don't <laughs> try to erect an antenna in the dark. You know, I know that a lot of people that have HOAs and stuff like that have done stuff like that, but don't try it. Know what's behind the trees that you're throwing the string over? Uh, if power wires are near, everyone involved should have been with the project should be wearing rubber gloves. Other protective gear, always wear a hard hat. And safety is everybody's responsibility. Okay? Remember, you have but one life and no antenna is worth losing it. <clears throat> I don't want to want to uh, emphasize safety. Mm -hmm. That's the biggest, that's the first thing about what all we're going to talk about tonight. Safety, just keep safety on your mind. All right, first thing we're going to talk about, a random wire antenna or long wire. Okay? It's the easiest antenna to build. It's the easiest antenna to put up. And it works remarkably well if it's put up correctly. Uh, a lot of people think random wire, well, I just stretch out any wire, the longer the better. And that's not true. Uh, the secret to having a good long wire, a random wire, in fed whatever long wire, is you don't want it to be a half wavelength on any frequency that you're going to use, or a multiple of a half wavelength. Okay? Uh, Random wire is probably one of the least expensive that uh, that you could have. Uh, you can use most any wire. Uh, Baling wire, uh, bare copper, uh, electric cord, uh, anything. You can go to Home Depot and buy a, buy a 500 foot spool for about 50 bucks and put up whatever antennas you need to put up. Uh, it, it's just, uh, and the long wire is obviously the the, uh, the cheapest of all of those. Uh, so basically, all you need uh, uh, for a random wire is some wire, your tuner, one or more supports up as high as you can get them to string the wire, like from your house to a tree in the backyard, someplace. Uh, and really, there's really no solder connections. It's just very simple. SWR is a rule. <clears throat> don't ever be fooled. Don't ever be fooled by uh, an ad in QST uh, anywhere else that says no tuner necessary. Okay? A wire 
or an antenna will only be resonant on one frequency. Okay? In other words, resonant means 50 ohm low to your to your uh, transceiver. And with today's transistorized transceivers, if it's not 50 ohms, it's going to cut the power back and save the transistors. So don't ever be fooled by somebody saying, oh, you don't need a tuner, you don't need a tuner. You might, on the resonant frequencies up and down the band, you might find one frequency that is resonant and be low SWR. So a tuner is almost a necessity nowadays. Tuners in your radios are designed to tune the ham bands. They're not designed to go outside of the ham bands. So if you're in Mars or uh, CAP or Coast Guard Auxiliary or shares where you're outside the ham bands, the tuner inside your radio may or may not work on a particular frequency. So it's always, if you're going to do a lot of that, buy a good tuner out the, the, uh, like outboard automatic tuner that will tune a lot a lot more uh, to get big, go down to a lot of higher SWR and tune them out. Uh, plus, if you're going to do long wire, <coughs> here's all the half waves of all the different frequencies. So you can see you go out half, you go out uh, a long ways. Matter of fact, that that's wrong. That's 246, not 2246. Uh, <coughs> those are uh, numbers you want to avoid. So if you want one to do a half wavelength to do all the do all these frequencies, or check it not a full of a half length. You got to do some figuring out how long it's going to have to be to not have a half wavelength on all those different frequencies. Yeah. But you can see that's 160, 80, 40, uh, 60 meters. No, I mean uh, 30 meters, 15. I don't know the middle was 15. I mean uh, 20, 15, and 10. So luckily, some gentleman went through and figured out all of these. I, I didn't give you that. I, I could have put the chart in there with all these uh, numbers and everything on it, but why? This guy, uh, no, I don't go there. no, he didn't, he didn't say. Uh, but here it is. There's your, there's your length for long arc. You can deviate maybe one or two feet in some cases, but I wouldn't. If you're going to make one 203 feet long, make it 203 feet long. Okay? Uh, and that, those, those numbers represent that there's no half wave on any of these, any of the frequencies that we use. Okay? So that's the important thing about. Uh, Long wires. Okay. Now, you may get one if you decide that you're going to do it some other length. You may get two or three frequencies that it will work perfectly on, and a couple of us you will not get a tuner. Tuner won't like it. Okay. So you got to you got to keep yourself somewhere in these in these numbers. Uh, for all practical purposes, that's the shortest one right there that you should try to put up. Tuners will do, tuners will tune a wire that is longer than what you're trying to, to reach. They don't like shorter. They'll tune them, but they don't like them. So, <laughs> if you're going to do all bands, that right there starts to, be, uh, if you're going to do 160, we're going to have to go up, up even further. But if you're going to do 80 through 20, 80 through 10, that's the shortest one you want to go to, right there, 71 feet. Yes? <coughs> a couple of questions. What we've got here is in inches, I'm assuming. Do I know? The length is in inches? No, that's feet. Feet. That's feet. Feet. <laughs> that's feet. <laughs> now, if you're, if you're going to put up a long wire for two meters, uh, then you're going to do some calculations yourself. It should be about 39 inches. 
Thirty-eight, thirty-nine inches. Okay. Yeah. Uh, okay. Yeah. Any other questions? Oh, okay. Go ahead. I got a, a question. I just bought an in-fed. Uh, Antenna for 10 to 80 meters. It's 132 feet long and it doesn't fall in that list, but it works great. I my tuner bam bam bam. Well, you've got a balance on the end of that though, don't you? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> that, oh, this is this just a plain thing. wire. Yeah. Oh, okay. you are. I misunderstood that. Yeah. Okay. That's, this I was is just a plain wire. Oh, all right. So got you got that. a little bit of a balance. You got a probably a four to one or a nine to one balance. Nine to one, I think. Yeah. yeah. All right. Yeah. Thank you. Encore. I've got two. Uh, I've got two in feds. Running out at the Navy base uh, for the Mars station out there. One of them is seven. One of them is 148 feet, and the other one is uh, two. Yeah, 203. Wow. So I got one that's for okay. like seven meg shorter one. The longer one is for the three meg. Okay, I understand. Go ahead. Yeah, the other question. I'm sure, everybody probably knows the answer to it. I don't. <coughs> when we're measuring the length. We're talking about end to end, not including whatever is wrapped around the end for a tile. All right, it depends on how you wrap it around at the end. Okay. Okay. My suggestion is that you skinny off the the outer uh, insulation, insulation, wrap it around and solder it. Okay. Wrap it around your. In other words, wrap it around the insulator, and uh, hang on one second. This is a dipole, but uh, see how I wrapped it around? Mm -hmm. And that stops it right there. All, all the wire that I wrapped around and everything else doesn't count because I've shorted it right there. So that's the end of it. So your measurement's going to be to the inside of the yeah. line. Now, if if you're going to go out and wrap around, wrap around, because that that and leave it, that's going to be part of the antenna. Mm -hmm. But you're only talking about three or four inches, right. so it's not going to make a whole lot of difference whether you you count it in there or not. <laughs> you hold. I, oh, I got my hand here. There we go. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> that's all right. I forgot you were filming. Yeah. All right. There we go. We'll talk about this antenna a little later. I have. Uh, I bring things along that, that you can see rather than me trying to explain it to you. Okay. Uh, you don't have to go and buy these things. <laughs> okay? You can make an end insulator out of a piece of PVC. You bring your wire in and then put your string on there. Works just as good as as any of these others. Uh, same thing about about center insulators. You can pay 15 bucks for that, or you can make one or you can make one like that for a few pennies. And that has nothing internal inside of it. Just the wires. Everything. Just the wires. Hmm. This one is not glued together because I want to show you you've got to pay for that. But even still, you're going to pay you're going to five bucks maybe to build that. Uh, that would be for like a dipole antenna. Yeah, this is for dipole. I'm getting a little ahead of myself. There's a nice one. That's twenty-two dollars. Uh, this is one that's been up for several years. It's a little bit different construction. Uh, matter of fact, if you look at the burnt, burnt. been hit by light, hit been hit by lightning, <laughs> but it still works. Uh, there's another one. So there are all sorts of things. Now here, here's a real simple one. Okay, it works. You know, uh, there's another. Twenty bucks for that. So you don't have to. And here's one that's even easier. Just loop it over. Bring your wires or your antenna in there and wrap that around that one and spin it out and wrap it around there. 
and you you got nothing and you got very almost five dollars here. Most expensive thing is probably that. So there's no reason you spend have to spend a lot of money on on doing that kind of thing. Of course, you don't need any of this if you're doing a long while. Okay, there's one device you do need, and I hope I brought it with me. <laughs> <laughs> I don't see it in there, so I'm not sure I brought it with me. But we'll get we'll talk some more about all these antennas again as we go as we go along. So, because I'll have a somewhere in the class somewhere maybe we just to continue on with this one we'll have a construction class and we'll talk about putting these things together and making them work. <coughs> Okay, that's there you go. Uh, that's a that's a random wire, long wire antenna. That's that's as simple as it is. You can at the end of your house, you can get a screw in eye hook, screw it in, attach it to there, come down with your wire, go into the house, into the radio. Now the device I should have brought and I didn't is a little device that you can. Plug into an SO239 on the back of your radio and hook your long wire to it. Uh, I'll bring it. I'll bring it another time. I thought I, brought, I thought I had it, but I didn't. <coughs> so that's as simple as it can be. And you got the gauge of the wire going out. <coughs> can be any gauge, really. Uh, 1996, I got sent to Atlanta to work the Olympics, and they put me up in a multi-story hotel and I wanted to work my radio. <laughs> so I went to Radio Shack and bought that little spool of hookup wire. It's 30 gauge. So it's not it's not much <coughs> bigger than human hair. Went to the hardware store and bought me a 10 inch, 8 inch bit and I drilled me a hole through the aluminum uh, window frame. <laughs> Wrapped me some solder around the end of that 30 gauge, fed it through the hole, and let it drop over the windowsill, and hook it up to my radio, and that's how I operated HF in Atlanta. So, it doesn't have to be 14 gauge, 12 gauge, uh, any, any gauge will do. It can be solid, it can be stranded, it doesn't make any difference. Solid's a little hard to work with because it's kind of stiff. So, I use 14 gauge stranded electric wire for all my antennas. And it works great. And it's actually a little bit, it's actually a little bit quieter because on bare wire you've got the wind blowing across it and that causes some noise. Second thing is when you use a insulated wire you've got to cut your, your, your uh, length down by about 5% because the, the uh, uh, insulation on the wire changes the velocity factor of the wire slightly. So for about four to five percent uh, less wire if you're using insulated wire. Another question while you're on the yes. screen. Yes. Yes. In your diagram there, I'm assuming the uh, antenna tuner would be inside the building. The what now? The antenna tuner. Yes. Well, I, it, well, you can't if you go if you get a, if they do sell remote tuners. Okay, and a remote tuner. On the wall, right there, where the antenna is, that it's going to work a little bit better than if you have it inside, uh, and it, especially if you run any kind of feed line to it. Uh, if you run the wire directly into the back of the antenna tuner, you don't have any problems with coax. Coax has inductance and capacitance, and if you put that in the antenna, it sometimes messes up the tuning. We'll talk about that in another class. Okay. But uh, yeah. Uh, <coughs> MFJ makes good makes a good remote tuner, and uh, uh, I use one. Uh, we got we, we're going to talk about at the club meeting. We're going to talk about Armed Forces Day. Well, I put up a couple of antennas for Armed Forces Day, and I use the remote tuner so I don't have to deal with a lot of a lot of feed line problems. You don't so, have to have a model number, do you? Do I? Do you have a model number for that? Remote. No, I don't. But we'll we'll talk about those a little bit in another, okay. in another class. Maybe we'll get into this one. <clears throat> All right. This is probably the most uh, common.
Foreman uh, antenna for hams. Uh, and believe it or not, I got a bad back guy, so I'm going to sit down for a minute. Uh, that pole antenna is the basis for every antenna made. Doesn't make a difference whether it's a beam antenna, a vertical antenna, horizontal loop antenna, a quad antenna, a even satellite dishes, satellite transmitting antennas are still the basis of their antenna is a dipole. Okay? There's a dipole strung between two trees. Each side of it is a half wavelength. Okay? I'm sorry. Quarter wavelength. Um, and that's there's two formulas. If you if you read in the books, you're gonna come up with a formula of four ninety two divided by the frequency in megahertz. And uh, that's for a, a dipole in free space. Most hands don't put up a dipole. Most hands, I don't know why I got a picture or not. Let's see. Yeah. Most hands, because of supports and everything, put, put up an inverted V. So the, the formula for the inverted V is 468 divided by the frequency in megahertz. And the reason of that being is if you lower the ends of the dipole, the the impedance right here changes. A horizontal dipole like that, the, the impedance is actually, uh, right there, is actually 72 ohms. So with the new transistorized radios, you go, you'll never get a one-to-one -one SWR flat dipole like that. Okay? You're going to get 1.2, 1.3, and that's on HF, that's perfectly acceptable. Okay, perfectly acceptable. And the reason that, that and, and and the reason why they came up with that is because the old tube type radios had a had a extra knob that you had to tune. It was called the uh, uh, load control, and that was a output capacitor on the output of the uh, final amplifier that allows you to match between say 150 ohms and 30 ohms, okay, took the place of the antenna, a lot of antenna tuners. With the advent of the transistor, it's 50 ohm output. There's no tuner in the output of the transistor. It's 50 ohm. And they have circuitry inside that radio that if the SWR is, is such a, that say, SWR goes up to 1.7, 1.8, 1 1.9, it starts to cut back the power on those transistors, because SWR is heat, okay? And transistors don't like heat. Tubes, man, you get them, you get them glowing red hot, and they were just fine. But you can't do that with transistors. So they built circuitry in there, uh, what they call a fold-back circuit. As the SWR rises, it drops the, drops the power. So that's why the tuners, that's why the, the first transistorized radios that came at, out back in the late 70s, maybe a little bit earlier than that, uh, didn't have tuners in So you had to have some sort of external tuner. Okay? When they started putting tuners in them, again, they're small and compact tuners, so they're not as robust, so they won't carry... Because when you start getting, when you start trying to tune out high SWRs, you're generating a lot of current in the uh, devices on that tuner, the coils, the capacitors, and everything else, and uh, you can't burn them up. So <coughs> they, uh, the ones inside the radio are, are limited in what they can do. That's why I run all external tuners, even though every radio I've got's got a except for one, I think, or two, have got internal tuners. I run external tuners on everything. Uh, and I like the LDG tuner. Now, LDG is 
they're still in business, but they're not selling directly from their factory. They're, I think DX Engineering is now selling most of the LDG tuners. Uh, but, uh, and they've, they've got a great 100 watt remote tuner. And uh, you can put that thing in, put your antenna out there 50, 75 feet out in the yard and run a piece of coax, put that remote tuner out there right up the tuner, right up the antenna. And you can get rid of all those interfering coax things because the the tuning and the, and the resonance of that antenna is right there at the antenna, not back at your radio. Because, and if it's at your radio, then that coax going out to that antenna is part of the antenna. So anyway, that's uh, you need two. You need two supports. So if you got a bunch of trees in your yard, you're, you're lucky. You can probably get. But again, depends on what area. You know, an 80 meter 80 meter dipole is going to be 120 feet in total length. So you know, if you got 120 feet, most yards aren't that wide unless you live out in the country or someplace like that, or some gated community with two acre lots. Uh, so you got to think about it. Now uh, with inverted V, where you drop the ends down, you got to remember. Oh, oh, let's get to this. These ends right here need to be at least 10 feet off the ground because the ground in this antenna is a capacitor. So the high, if you blow these down towards the ground, the capacitance changes, and that's one of the reasons why the impedance up here changes. Plus. You got a capacitance between, you got a positive and a negative side of the antenna, so you got a capacitance between those two wires. So if you bring them down close together, the optimum, ang optimum angle on a, on a uh, <clears throat> inverted V should be somewhere between, uh, I say, 30 and 65 degrees, something like that. 30 and 60 degrees. 45 is optimum. Uh, you can get them closer and you can get them further apart, but optimum is about 45 degrees. Okay. Uh, it says here that the feet point of the apex should form a right angle. So uh, that's actually going to be 90 degrees at that point right there. But 45 is, 45 is workable. Double bazooka antenna. Yeah, I, <clears throat> I became the double bazooka champ. <laughs> matter of fact, every antenna I've got up right now, wire antenna, is a double bazooka. The double bazooka was developed in the early years of radar. If you've ever seen an early radar uh, uh, antenna, it was a series of horizontal dipoles. <coughs> the theory of radar, and some of you may be radar technicians, so if I get off track, raise your hands and say, hey, you're full of, full of you know what. Uh, <coughs> but uh, uh, the idea of radar is it sends out a signal pulse and it waits for a reflection from some object to come back. And depending upon the time interval and all that stuff tells you exactly pretty much how far out that, that device is. Um, my dad was stationed in Jacksonville, Florida, who was in the Navy, and when I went down there one time, they have a a East Coast radar set up out there, and they've got a radar that's going around this way, and they've got one here that's going up and down, like this. And the whole idea is this one tells them how far it is away, this one tells them how high it is. So. They had those things, and they might have had the big. The, 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 the early World War II radars, the screen, the antennas were, I don't know, let's just, for instance, they were 100 feet square, and they probably had 50 or so dipoles, and all those were being fed out, out of a, trans, a transmitter and receiver. And they were just, the British, they just aimed it towards France, because <laughs> that's where the Germans were coming from. They didn't rotate. They ain't aimed that way. Uh, these ones you see around Memphis with the domes, there. And the faster, the faster it spins, the closer in it's looking. If they're really looking out far, they will rotate 
slower because you want that pulse to go out and give it time to come back. And it's, you know, it's light, you know, it's, it's, it's speed of light, so I mean, it's, it's not going to take long, but it's still going to do it. So if you go to the airport, you might see one at the end of one of the runways doing one of these, and if you get up and look on top of the tower, you've got one up there that's doing this because he's just looking close in. He's not looking out, out, out far. Okay. Uh, that was one of the things I did with the phone company. I used to. The FAA on Democrat Road had a microwave that went from there over into Arkansas. They had a, ra a radar station over there. And I used to have to maintain that, that uh, microwave. Okay, double bazooka. You can read about it. By the way, I don't know. And as we get into this, if anybody wants, I can get you a CD. I'll, I'll burn you a CD of this whole, this particular class, uh, if you want. Uh, all it cost is a CD. Uh, if you got, whoop, hit the wrong button again. If you if you Google that on the internet. You're going to get 250,000 different uh, posts or comments or whatever on this antenna. And every one of them, all 249 of them, are going to have a different uh, opinion of this antenna than I do. So I'm going to go deaf before this is over with. I can hear it. Now my hearing aids are going out. I forgot to change them. Oh, well. <clears throat> Bazooka was developed at staff of MIT for radar use. Uh, the original Bazooka was used, used coax cable for the entire radiating elements. The adaptation of this, you use an amateur, you use coax only for the broadband portion. I mean, if you can see it, but that's all made out of coax, including uh, somewhere that went. I don't know. Oh, there it is. Should have undone this before I brought it out here. This I, I made this antenna for 18 for 18 megapixels or 18 meters, whatever they call that. 18. All right, now now you can see from this from the center conductor out to here is the broadband section of this. The center conductor and the shield are twisted together and soldered right there. Hmm. This wire is then soldered on the, onto that connection and goes out. This is the broadband part. This, this pretty much is the radiating part. Okay? And all, yeah, 18 megahertz is what I, what, what I made that for. Never have put it up. Uh, you will find if you go on the internet and these guys are going to swear it is a one frequency antenna well I'm going to tell you I have one up at my shack that is made, was made for 3 megahertz that's a, a Mars frequency that we use and I use it for everything a tuner on it, and it works. So don't be fooled by somebody's uh, opinion. Okay? <laughs> you need to say anything? Yes, sir. May I interrupt for just sure. one moment? Sure. Um, I would ask all of you that are attending HAM 101, we have a uh, program survey. If you take just a minute to scan this and fill it out, you're getting a pre look at the me me member meeting survey as well, but if you would take a minute and give uh, Ham some positive feedback, 
and let us know that the um, is well received. It gives us the leadership team a, a mechanism to to uh, take into account what's going on and how we need to make things better. So if I can ask you to just uh, I'll leave the big copy yeah. here. Yeah. I yeah, apologize. I'll, I've got to step out and yeah, take care of things. Put it right here on the end of this. Y'all do that. Appreciate it. Uh, Thank you, sir. I yeah. apologize for interrupting. No problem. No problem. So, <coughs> get back here. there are always uh, several different ways to to uh, make this thing. You, you, you notice here that you can use the elements of construction of twin lead or ladder line. Ladder line is preferable because it's stronger. Um, if it's a single band antenna, it will not radiate harmonics if you're operating frequency. Well, that's that's another misconception because if it if it'll if you put one up for 80 meters and it works well on 40, then it's it radiates the harmonics. Okay. Uh, it's broadband characteristics make it ideal for 80 meters and 10 meters. So it, 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 they contradict themselves right there. Uh, Half wave length of coax. Now this is this is a half wave length RF wave length of coax. And you know the difference between an RF wave, an RF measurement, and a standard measurement. If you use a 468 formula, that will not resonate on 80 meters. You've got to take into consideration the velocity factor of the coax. So it'll be a little shorter. So that's what you've got to, I've got a formula, there'll be some formulas for this here in a little bit. The outside of the coax and the ladder line operate as a half wave dipole. The inside of the coax elements which do not radiate are quarter wave shorted stubs which present a high resistive impedance feed point at resonance. All that's to say it works. Okay, I hate. I used to hate to chase electrons in a circuit. Most boring thing ever. Well, the same way with a lot of these scientific formulas and all this good stuff that a lot of these and very intelligent people put in these books. I, I build an antenna if it works. That's all I'm care. All I care about. I don't care about the rest of it. Anyway, the off resonant off resonant stubs change in such a way as to cancel the antenna's reactance. Thus, increasing the bandwidth of the antenna. Remember, I told you that antennas only resonant on one frequency. The bandwidth is how, like from the two, two, two to one SWR points, up from the resonant frequency and down from the resonant. That's your bandwidth. So basically, you can operate anywhere inside that bandwidth with less than two to one SWR, which is what you shoot for on HF. You can go to 3 to 1 and it's not going to hurt you. Other it's going to cut your power back if you run the transistor radio. On VHF at 2 meters you want to stay under 2 to 1. Higher frequency go, the more the more effect, uh, the more uh, uh, the SWR uh, affects the antenna. So there, there's your there's your uh, there's your diagram. Now, again, if you get on the internet and you Google this stuff and read all these things, the guy, there's going to be a guy on there, or at least one, maybe more, that's going to tell you that you might as well throw it away if you use RG58 or RG8X to build it. Well, I built all mine out of RG8X. Uh, and they work just fine. I sold them many of them. You know, I had a little, uh, like a little ham radio company there for a while, and I sold. Never, had, I had one, one come back, and my measuring device screwed up, and one side of it was longer than the other, so I had to fix that. Uh, and I've made them 80, 40, 20, 15, 10, uh, so. They work, and that's the bottom line. You know, uh, about all these antennas, they work. Matter of fact, I'm not going to talk about antennas that I have not used. Okay, 
because I don't want you to. If you want to learn about some strange antennas, I've got all kinds of books up here you need to buy to learn all about strange antennas. Okay? I've even got one AWL puts out small antennas for HOA people. Uh, and uh, you can get AWRL. AWRL's got a pretty good selection of good stuff. So you don't need these to take these away. <coughs> uh, so that's the basic design. Now it, it shows it shows hard line, but it, I mean uh, ladder line, but it's not. Uh, this is your shield. Uh, now I'm talking. This is these. Yeah, this is your shield. You see where it's joined together down here and down here. This is your center conductor, and it's joined together there and there. So the the, the circuitry goes. That's your that's your stub. That's the one that they makes it broadbanded. And this, I, I use just plain old uh, electric wire on the end of it. You can use coax, twist, twist the center conductor and the outer shield together on both ends. You can use coax. You can use uh, ladder line, same thing. You've got to twist the two of them together. You can use whatever. It's just easier for me. And what what, what you saw here, and, and, and like I say, we'll, if everybody wants it, we'll do a construction class. This is just a little piece of PVC, uh, you know, like half inch or something PVC. And uh, I block up the end after I get everything. I just uh, stuff something in there. And then I poured uh, fiberglass resin down inside the tube. And that strengthens that connection of where I twisted this wire at the end of this one. And then I just covered it with a piece of heat shrink. So that works really well. Uh, and these, I'm going to put this up one of these days. Uh, I, don't do much, I don't do much radio anymore. And one of the reasons is that I'm hearing impaired and it's very hard for me to hear on the radio. So that's why I don't do much in the way of transmitting and receiving anymore. Uh, Cam, question? Yes. <clears throat> Am I seeing a connection up there at the uh, the center point uh, between the uh, signal and the shield? Yes. They're both. They're both. Yeah, I I, I misspoke. The shield. Ah. That's the shield. Okay. The shield is split, but the. The uh, center conductor is straight through. It, it, the, the people that tell you about buildings they tell you not, not to uh, break the center. So in other words, what to do is go around and you take off part of it, bring the two shields down, okay? And uh, so that shield goes around this way, and then you have the, the center conductor straight through. Well, that's a pain. <laughs> Believe me. So I got thinking about it one day. I said, you know what? I'm going to break that center conductor. I'm going to strip it and get it all in, in, in the in, in, inside the center conductor. Then I'm going to twist it back together and I'm going to solder it. And I'm going to wrap it with some Teflon tape. I didn't see any difference in the, in the performance of those antennas. And it made it a whole lot easier to build. I mean, I was building, I was building 10, 15 of them. Well, I was probably building 10 a week. When we were in business, so uh, again, there'll be people that disagree with me vehemently, but I put them up and they work. That's all I care about. Okay, here's your here's your. Uh, if you want to write these down, uh, the overall length the overall length is. Um, 460 divided into frequency and megahertz. Okay, so if I was going to make one for 3.922, I'd divide that into 460 and come up with 115.28 feet. And that's the entire length. The, uh, that's 80, okay? That's from there to there. The uh, length B to D 
which is the the uh, the stub light here to here. is 320 divided by 3.922 or 81.59 feet. Uh, now what I have found, they don't tell you here, they don't tell you, but I have found that every one of them I made by these formulas were too long because nobody took in the velocity factor of the color. So, RG58, RG8 is probably 0.66, the velocity factor. So you've got to multiply, uh, you got to multiply these two lengths by 0.66, and you'll come up with with uh, a closer number. Uh, of course, if you're going to use a tuner on it, if it's a little long, that's good because. The tuner will tune the long end until it's better than the short one. Okay. And then the feed line, uh, not the feed line. Uh, they didn't tell you, but then you got to look. I keep it in the wrong button. You've got to take this figure away from that figure to find out what the wires are in the end. He doesn't tell you up here how to do and then they're looking. They look at these these uh, these numbers. These numbers right here look awful familiar to those numbers we saw on the on the uh, long wire. And that's uh, the length of coax that feeds it best. Okay. Could you still use an antenna analyzer on this to get sure. down to a critical frequency you that you want? Mm -hmm. yeah. Problem I have with that is that when I'm building 40 and 80 meter, I have a place to put them up and check. Okay. So I just did them as close as I could to these numbers, and they worked all the work just fine. Some of us have to put them up and take them down. Yeah, them yeah. <laughs> because once, well, the thing, the thing about it is, once you do this, once you do this piece, you can't hardly cut it and make it shorter or longer. So you just got to be sure that you do the formula right, mm -hmm. and uh, it works out. Uh, yeah, they tell you RGAX for high power, 58 or 59, hot glue. And that, that's what they covered all that stuff with. And I feel <coughs> if you notice <coughs> on this, there's a I drill a hole in it after I get it all glued together, and I fill it full of. Pop through, I mean, uh, power glass resin. So it's there's no water going to get in that whatsoever. <coughs> All right. It's very efficient single band, very quiet, does not require the use of a ballon. Uh, consists of RG58. I have built one out of RG8. Now, the problem is it weighs a freaking ton. Okay? Uh, as operated as a multi band antenna by using a suitable tuner, as with most antenna projects, to get the double bazooka up as high as possible, some tuning of the length for uh, best SWR may be required, and you can use materials that are easily obtainable. So you can snip, play with that end piece if you use this wire. Might and do some tuning. I, like I said, I went strictly by the formulas. Let it run. And that's it in detail. You can see pretty much that's 300 ohm twin lead. Uh, R can be one piece of number 12 wire. Uh, so you can see exactly how that is. And I, and I, put, I put a piece of PVC over this junction right here and fill it full. Uh, resin and it makes it good and strong. I've never had one break there. Horizontal loop antenna. This is a pretty doggone good antenna for close in. Uh, 
And that's what it is. It's a, it's a full wavelength on whatever frequency you want, and it's definitely tunable. You use any, you, you, you can uh, you put up one for 80 meters, you can use it for everything. But you're talking about 60, about 63 feet aside. So you're talking about a 240, 250 foot uh, inside. How high up the ground? Depends how far you want to talk. Uh, <laughs> at least 10. Huh? Uh, the higher you go, the longer you're going to talk. So mine are 20 feet off the ground. I only want to. I don't really want to talk about 500 miles. Excuse me, five or 600 miles on my loop because it's cut to the uh, uh, Mars frequency. The, the wing I'm in is is uh, southern southeastern corner of the United States. So you know I'm only. Uh, thousand miles is probably the most I'm going to go. Uh, so mine's you know there's somewhere between 20, 20 and 30 feet off the ground. The the most the best thing you can do is make the inside of this as big as possible. So in reality, the best horizontal loop you can get one is in a circle. That gives you the the most area inside the loop. But that's not feasible for most people. So put up a square like that, it works just fine. Uh, this is another a triangular, and that's a vertical loop, but uh, you know, you can do that. I had one of those up for 40 minutes one time. And, uh, and the form, I don't know if I got the formulas for that or not. Well, it'll, it'll talk about it. Now, you got one, th one thing I, I do want to emphasize. But if you put ladder line, if you put ladder line on it right here, you got to realize that's part of the antenna. So you've got a remote bow in there. That, that bow in would probably be do better if you've got a post like this, put that, that, that bow in the, to the post and terminate the loop right there and then run coax in. Because that ladder line becomes part of that antenna. So if you do this, for 80 meters, don't take that into consideration. Then it'll never get resonant. But you definitely have to use the tuner. Uh, the one I've got up, I've got a ladder line down to a four, uh, to, a four to one balance. And it works pretty good. But I use it basically mostly for receiving antenna because it's quiet. And uh, uh, so I don't, I don't transmit on it very often. Uh, vertical loop, good DX antenna. Shape could be a circle, square, rectangle, triangle. The larger the area of the loop, the better it will work. Uh, remote 4 to 1 balance. Multi band is possible uh, when feeding the loop with coax. So you can, you can, uh, uh, and, and then mostly, most of the, most of the horizontal loops will work 40 and 80. Uh, because dipole antennas and stuff like that are very uh, large. And a lot of times in, in, a, in a person's uh, yard, you can put up a couple of masts, make a square one, rectangular one, horizontal loop. A whole lot easier you can run a 180 foot uh, inverted V. There it is, 105 divided by the frequency in megahertz. We must subtract 4% to 10% of the total full wavelength if we are using insulated wire. That's that velocity factor that we talked talk about earlier. Uh, so 160 meter loop, 160 meter loop is 558 feet. Uh, shorten the overall length by 4%, that's 22 feet. So 536 feet, and uh, the length of the 450 on the ladder line may require some final adjustment as it may become part of the loop and serve as a radiator. So if you can get, if you've got some way you can mount the ballon out there at the corner of that, or don't want to mount it to mid span because it'll make it, the weight of it will make it sag. Uh, 
and then serve, and then feed him a coax, he'd be a whole lot better off. Any questions? All right, they're going to talk about all this stuff. Uh, uh, and this is what they talk about. Uh, do not be misled by reports, mostly from those who have never tried it, that it's only a vertical radiator or cloud warmer design. And it, uh, that's very true. Uh, the maximum angle of radiation at, at, at 20 feet is like this. At 30 feet, it's like this. At 40 feet, it's like this. At 50 or 60 feet, it's out like this, which determines how far out that signal goes before it's refracted back to Earth by the ionosphere. That gives you your distance. So if you're looking for something just to do five or six hundred miles around the house, 20 feet off the ground, it's plenty. Almost a Nevis antenna. Anybody know what a Nevis antenna is? Near vertical. Yeah. Near incident sky wave antenna. In other words, cloud warmer. But anyway, we'll going to talk about that here before the day. Hopefully, we'll see. yeah, we still got 30 minutes. Uh, but like I said, it's uh, you, when you use that line, you'd be impressed with its performance as a transmitter and surprised at how quiet it is as a receiver antenna. And that's what I use mine for mostly is receiver antenna. Uh, I, I, we we run two nets a two nets a day on on Mars, and in the evenings. Uh, the frequency that we're on in the evenings is, is awful noisy, but I can flip over to, and I can't hear the net control very well on, on my uh, double bazooka at 60 feet, then I flip over to my horizontal loop at 20 feet, and a lot of times it'll be as clear as well. So it's, it, it is definitely a good receiver, receiver in time. Use 12 gauge. I don't think you're going to get a 500-foot roll of wire from Home Depot for $55 anymore. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I think it's probably going to be $65 or $70 now. Okay, the most critical element is that the loop should encircle the largest area possible. A circle or square or rectangle is much better than an elongated oval or a triangle or a dog bone shape. So a nice square horizontal loop will do you fine. Again, never install any portion of the loop or feeder line above or below power line. So, uh, the higher above ground you can hang the antenna better. Now that depends on what you want to do. To if you're looking for something to reach out Touch some folks overseas, yes, high as possible. If you're looking for something just to drag you around the country, intermediate length. And if you're like me, just want something to cover five or six hundred miles, 20 feet off the ground is fine. And you can feed it at any point you want to. Uh, I feed mine in the middle of one side because all I'm using is an insulator and then the latter one. Uh, but if you're going to put a balance, remote balance out, then you better do it at one of the corners. Uh, or you can attach the balance to your support. All band antenna. Now, I know a lot of guys have asked me about this, and I, I added this specifically. And I don't have a lot of information because it's simple. There's the all band antenna, or fan dipole. A lot of people talk to it, talk about it as being a fan dipole. And that's the reason. And that's the reason why, because you have one center insulator, one uh, uh, transmission line, and then you go half wavelength on 80, half wavelength on 40, half wavelength on 20, half wavelength on 10. Now, I know the question is running in your mind. What about 15? Well, 15 is a is a uh, uh, harmonic of 40. So you can run 15 on the 40 meter part of <coughs> that dipole. Now, it doesn't show it, but you can, I should have bought one of those with it right too. You can buy a fiberglass rod that's, oh, quarter inch round, maybe 
three eighths, and you can drill it, and so you can use you can use that to space these things out uh, a little better than what they're showing there. And uh, uh, I know several people that run them, and they they have really really good really good results. Matter of fact, I was talking to one guy Saturday at the free fest. Uh, which, if you didn't come by and see me, you missed a lot of good bargains. He—he <laughs> uh, uh, he was he kind of—I'm not going to tell you his name, so he can't go back to him and say what I said. But he's a little animal, and he's got every one of his—he's got 80, 40, and 20, and they are exactly one to one SWR. So, on a particular frequency. He doesn't have to use a tuner, but still, if he deviates from that one frequency, then he still he still uses a tuner. In fact, I sold him one uh, Saturday. <laughs> uh, I like sold him two. That's all right. Uh, and they work. They they work. And you know, a lot of, a lot of people, a lot of hams are are hamstrung, no pun intended, by the amount of property they've got, and where they've got trees and so forth and so on. So. If you've got it and that's all you can put up, man, go for it. It's a little harder, but every one of those is going to be affected by the others. So once you get it up and you get 80 meters all lights, you put the 41 up and you're go back to 80 and it's going to be changed. So it's a little work, it's a little work to get it. But if you've got a good tuner, you know, just as long as it's halfway decent in the uh, uh, SWR range, then go for it. Don't worry about getting it one to one or one to two or one five or whatever. I have to ask a question because sure. are each one of those separate wires all from a center point coming out of that? Yes. Okay. Because the, the, the one the one the great thing about RF is long ago to the resident element. Okay. So you don't have to worry about it. So they're gonna go to it's kind of like electricity. I mean, the lightning. Lightning goes to the, to the point of least resistance to ground. Well, that's exactly the RF goes to the to the, the least the least resistance is going to be uh, the resonant point. Are they all parallel to each other? I mean, is there the oh, angle yeah. or length critical? Or just all one. Well, uh, yeah. I mean, each length's got to be. Uh, well, I understand that. I yeah. just the, the no, concept yeah. of what they're looking at. A lot of guys just take, I've seen guys take individual wires off the ends of those things and make it like that all the way to the ground, which I think is kind of ridiculous. But you can get some, oh, you can get some PVC, some of that real short PVC. You know, it's about as big as my thumb. You just make you some separators and do it. Uh, like I say, there's, there, there are things that we can talk about if we get into a construction construction class that uh, uh, how, how to build these antennas that, that can come up and do a little better. Excuse me, guys, I just got a text. Okay, here's one that the military uses and swears by. Now, I built one, and it was great. It was silent, it was quiet, and everything else. But, when I got to really looking at it, if I tuned in to, if, if my S meter showed the, with the noise was down about S5, or 6, or 7, and with, on a regular dipole, it was up around 10 dB over. It's really quiet. The problem is, I turned right around when I did that and tuned into WWB, which is 20 dB over S9 on a regular antenna. When I went to this antenna, it was down around S5. So, <laughs> it's a great antenna. The military uses it because they can put 20,000 watts through it. <laughs> and... Uh, and they've got very sensitive receivers and everything else, so they they can use it. But I don't, I don't, uh, I'm not going to say I don't recommend it. Uh, I 
because I was probably exaggerating a little bit on the noise, but it's definitely uh, uh, the, the atmospheric noise and the signal are both down from a regular and the dipole antenna. <coughs> so it's a it's a uh, uh, it's it's terminated folded dipole. So that means that it's again like like the <coughs> double bazooka. It comes off two feet line and it's a double double uh, folded dipole. In other words, halfway length on each side. You've got a terminating resistor right here, which is about 600 ohms. And you have a, uh, uh, I don't know, I can't remember whether it's 9 to 1 or 12 to 1 balance in there. And this is okay for voice, single sideband. Can't run digital on it. When you run digital on this, uh, the 100% duty cycle burns that resistor out right there, 600 ohm resistor. So you can't you can't run digital one, uh, and of course you can put it up like a dipole. You can put it up like a sloper. Uh, and it tells you typical SWR. This is one built for all bands. So at 1.8 megs, it's two to one. Uh, at the high end of 10 meters, it looks like about 1.3 to one. So it, it's it's good. It, it, it's, a, it's a good antenna. It just, to me, it just doesn't perform as well as I would like it to perform. You know, I built it because of, they said it's quiet, and they, they're right. It is quiet. Uh, I, I, I refer to it as an air-cooled bun dummy load. <laughs> <laughs> but there are a lot of guys, especially guys who were in the Navy and places like that, where they had an HF on ships and so forth. They saw a lot of these antennas. And that's the formulas uh, if you want to if you want to do it. Uh, a lot of work. You can buy those fiberglass rods, drill holes in the end of them, run your wire through it, and then wrap it with some little wire to keep them moving. And, make, and, and you can make it look just like that. Uh, and I've, I've still got the ballon and the resistor somewhere in my junk box. All right, here's your Nevis antenna. Near vertical incident sky wave antenna. Nevis. Use them on all HF ham bands to work the skip zone. Out to about a thousand miles. Uh, area behind obstructions and dense foliage. To hear near stations just beyond the ground wave range. Great for we field day and contesting as a gap filler. Easy antenna for HF mountain topping and camping, and camping trips. Get RF out of deep canyons. And the reason is is because the uh, major uh, RF loads are almost vertical. Okay? Whereas other beams are out this way. But these are major loads of the trend, just like that. To get into propagation, we'll talk a little more about the major and minor loads. Uh, this is not a DX antenna. It needs an antenna tuner for a good uh, good match. Power is limited to about 200 watts. 200 watts, not watch. And that's kind of that's. I know that's a little confusing. <coughs> the best thing about it is here. You've got a 125 foot wire going here, <coughs> connected to a 38 foot wire going that way, and the same thing over here. So it's kind of a Kind of an off, there's two off center uh, bed dipoles in there. And they, here you have this 45 feet, 25 feet, so forth and so on. So, 15 foot mass, so it's, it's easy, it's something easy to put up. Uh, and it's a good emergency antenna because, in most cases, if there's some sort of disaster where you've got to go out there and set up your HF rig to say that to. Talk from Memphis to Nashville. This would be a great antenna for that. Because you don't want it to go very far. You want it to go up and down. You don't want it to go out to Denver, Colorado. You're not going to help anybody out there. You want to get somebody in Nashville. 
You can do the same thing with a with a whip vertical on your on your vehicle and lay it over on its side like this and you pretty much do the same thing. And there are all sorts of things. People again, uh, again, if you go to if you go to uh, the internet and Google it, you're going to get 150,000 different ideas, and opinions, and swear up and down it don't work. This kind of stuff. I built one, uh, and it worked. But I have I, I, it's it's in one of my antenna boxes somewhere. All right, that's that's the end of the. Man, we just about did. I got twenty minutes. Questions? Anything? No. Do you have any directional uh, taper one direction to the other? The nevis? Any, any of them? Like that. yes, yes. Uh, the dipole, the dipole, horizontal dipole, is this way and that way. Okay, so if I'm facing, if I'm looking at, at north, then, then the, the maximum uh, radiation of that antenna is going to be north and south. Inverted beam, pretty much the same, except you are going to get radiation east and west off the off the uh, uh, being bent down the, the V part of it. Uh, Double bazooka, same way. If you're up here like this, it's going to be north and south. If you dip down, you're going to just like a, a uh, horizontal wire. I mean, a uh, random wire depends on the length. Uh, didn't bring anything to draw on the board, so I'm not going to draw. Uh, the wire is going from here to the corner of the of the room. The major lobes or the, the, the major lobes of radiation are going to be off this way. Okay? And the shorter, like if you put up a half wavelength wire, these are they're going to be out here. If you put up a three or four wavelength wire, then those major lobes are going to almost follow the wire. Okay. Uh, <coughs> Now we didn't. We really. We really didn't. We really didn't cover the vertical antenna. Uh, I have another section of class comparing a vertical to a dipole, and we'll talk about that. The vertical antenna is omnidirectional. Okay. Now you can phase vertical antennas, and when you phase a vertical antenna, you can get. <coughs> you can phase it in such a way that if this is one vertical. And the tripod is another vertical. You can phase it so the maximum radiation goes that way. And by changing the phasing lines, you can make it go this way. And then if you just if you don't phase them at all, if you just feed them half wavelength in the middle, then the the, the maximum radiation will be off the, the sides of it. So there are ways to steer these antennas. That's a whole another a whole another. Uh, class stuff. Uh, talk about that because you've got to, when you're making your phasing lines and all that stuff, they have to be RF length. You can't be physical length. they got to be RF. they got to be tuned. Yeah? I can use a few minutes later. Did you talk to me about an in-fed halfway? Do I now in-fed halfway? Yes. Well, an in-fed halfway is just a random wire antenna to fit with a balance. Okay? But it's halfway length. And the balance takes out some of the Problems that you have tuning because you're using the, you're tuning through the balance. Okay, that's just like when he put up. We tell me he put up uh, a wire and it was didn't the, the length of it didn't coincide with any of those. I'm using two of them out at the uh, out at the Mars station at, at uh, Millie mm -hmm. uh, because when they kicked us off base and we had to find a place on, on the north side, uh, we didn't know we were going to be able to put up the tower. So I put up two in-fed uh, long wires. Uh, and they work really well. And uh, uh, matter of fact, I I don't even use them now because we put up a three-element beam with a 40 40-meter add-on kit on it. So 
uh, 40 meters is probably about all the 40 meter band is all we pretty much work out there on the Mars side. So I don't use them, but they're there and they work really well. A little expensive. The uh, balance is about uh, 110, 12 dollars, mm. and then you can use any wire you want to. Yeah, I've seen some of them supposedly you can get them. Myantennas.com. Yeah. If you want to go to that on the internet, they have all kinds of infeds and all that stuff with the balance and their. Actually, it's it's an it's an it's an un -un. In other words, it's unbalanced, unbalanced. It's not really a balance. Uh, a balance. The reason it's called a balance. It's balanced to unbalanced. So uh, they, 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 it's actually an un -un. Now let's talk about next week or next month. Do we want to continue and go into a construction class? Mm -hmm. Huh? Mm -hmm. What do you think? Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. That's what we'll do. I'll bring some. We, we're not going to. We're not going to build a big antenna. So I'm going to bring in just some stuff and show you some techniques on uh, on putting these things together. And we'll talk about. We'll talk a little bit about vertical antennas too, because uh, we probably have some time left over. Uh, I was a very very opposed to vertical antenna uh, until I got to playing around on for field day. I wanted to phase. Uh, 20, 15, and 10 meter verticals. And so I did. I built all the phasing lines and boxes to switch some phasing lines one way or the other and all that good stuff. And I also put up that year at field day, this was about five, six years ago, I put up dipoles on 20, 15, and 10. That's where I was working. And I found out that there's absolutely no difference in performance between the phase verticals and dipoles up about 30, 40 feet. And it sure is a whole lot simpler to go pound a stake in the ground and put a vertical up as it is to try to get antennas up in trees and everything else. Mm -hmm. So <clears throat> to make a long story short, a couple years ago, man, it's been a little bit more than that, I decided I wanted to go, I wanted to work 80 meters at night. So I bought a 50, 50 foot fiberglass mast, and some of you were out when I first put it up to help me put it up with guy wires and everything else. A little, a little bit more difficult to put up, but that thing worked everything. I worked everything from 80 meters to 10 meters on it, and did really well. I was really pleased with it. So we're definitely going to talk about vertical antennas because uh, there are ways, like if you're in an HOA, I can give you a way to use a, use a flagpole making an antenna. The HOA won't know the difference. And uh, HOA, Homeowners Association. Uh, and if they ever get this bill passed through Congress, we won't have to worry about that. But they're having a hard time getting it done. 